Welcome to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green, and this is a contextualized reading lecture for book one of Homer's Odyssey. We're using the Robert Fagel's translation. So book one opens with uh, the title, Athena Inspires <laughs> the Prince. And we get an invocation. So let me jump in here. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds, many pains he suffered, heart sick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all, the blind fools. They devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god blotted out the day of their return. Launch out on his story, muse, daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time, too. So get this opening passage, this opening invocation of the muse, very popular, very well known, maybe not so much popular, um, of the muse. And so we might ask at the beginning here, who is the muse? <laughs> um, and traditionally speaking, the muse is um, um, Calliope, the daughter of Zeus, highest of gods. Um, uh, and the her mother is going to be um, uh, uh, Nemesine or memory. Uh, she is the muse of epic poetry. Um, we also know at the beginning, and, and if we look at the next sentence that I'm just about to read here, by now all of the survivors, all who avoided headlong death were safe at home, escaped. The, escape the wars and waves. And so we begin after this invocation of the muse Calliope um, uh, with, we're just kind of thrown in the middle of things. And so if you've ever had a course on Homer before, we know that epics often start in the middle of things. Um, the genre here is epic, um, where we're getting not a specific amount of time as we might get in a play, or a tragedy, for example, and we're getting a third person type of narrator, right? These are all qualities of the epic genre. Um, so I say, why is this important? Um, why is it important that we be, begin in the middle of things? It's well, it has to do with with um, the heavily mythological uh, importance uh, going on in a text like Homer's Odyssey. Um, and whenever we're dealing with myths, we're dealing with the idea of intertextuality, right? It's what holds something together uh, in a culture um, to, to know who the major figures are of the culture. Um, so we don't use the term myth in this class, like a lie, for example. Um, myths work and are sustained by the idea of intertextuality. And intertextuality is how we generally think of how culture works. And so one way to think of this is to think of the word text as being like a web, right? Just like a spider's web. Um, so myths can be thought of as instances of telling and retelling that emerge from an unseen text that we might call culture itself. Uh, in their book, um, The Truth of Myth, uh, Talk Thompson and uh, Gregory Shrimp define myth as such. Quote, narratives of profound cultural and individual importance that some, in some way help establish our symbolic sense of the ultimate shape and meaning of existence, of ourselves, of everything in the cosmos, and perhaps especially of the relationship between the two. So we get in the first stanza here, uh, as I go back, um, we get a reference to the cattle of the sun, personified by Helios, 
who's one of the Titans. And a reader of Greek mythology will know that there was an earlier, quote, race of divine beings called the Titans, who were um, the first offspring of Gaia, who is the earth, um, and Uranus, which is sky, right? We get the, the name Uranus from the the planet, right, from Uranus, the Greek word for sky. So the earth and the sky get together and they're um, in a sexual relationship. And from their sexual relationship, they spring um, of various beings. Um, but one of the sets of beings is the Titans, who are then later overthrown by a younger race um, of gods, um, with the head of them being this, this figure, Zeus, who overthrows his father, Kronos, or time, right? So always in Greek mythology, there's going to be this recurring theme of the overthrowing of an earlier father type of deity, or that there's going to be some sort of patricide, right? The killing of, of parents. Um, but, you know, do you need to know that from the beginning to understand the text? No, but it's part of the fabric of the culture um, beneath it, right? It's part of that intertextuality. And the book is heavily laden with allusions, right? Um, or references to other stories that the Greek person would have known, the general Greek Greek citizen would have known it like the way that somebody in my culture might refer to characters from Star Wars, for example. Uh, um, and so we need to sort of keep that in mind as readers of Homer, um, uh, that, that, that he's weaving all sorts of references together. And it's from the makeup of those references that we get something like an, a shared understanding of culture. Um, so uh, Odysseus's men at the beginning here in the middle of things, they're doomed from the outset. They were doomed um, from being able to return home because they devoured the sun god's cattle against Odysseus's and the other gods' warnings. So as the text notes here, the recklessness of their ways destroyed them all. So this is another theme that's going to be recurring throughout Greek texts is human excess, right? When humans step beyond their own type of limits, the ways that our folly as humans ends up being the downfall or our destruction. Um, it's somehow a part of our own fault. Um, so constantly in Greek mythology, humans show their mortal weaknesses by striving beyond their own limits. The culture and the gods have a general contempt for this inherent foolishness in other humans. You see that like the blind fools right in that passage, right? Uh, um, humans are not generally considered by gods at all, though occasionally as with Odysseus, um, and Athena, who takes some special favor, an individual human might um, uh, find themselves on the subject of a god's eye gaze or, or a god's favor. Uh, we basically know from the beginning, um, the opening lines of the book here, that uh, first of all, Odysseus's men don't make it back home, <laughs> um, but that he implicitly does, at least from the opening lines. What happens in the end of the book, right, is completely secondary to the telling of the story itself. So this isn't a book where we look towards, we can flip to the end just to see what happens. That's not what the tale is about. Uh, Thompson and Shrimp write, quote, Oftentimes, myths are performed in special contexts where time and the sacred conceptually lessen the distance between the everyday life and that of the mythic. So myths are often enacted in rituals. For example, the sense of narration than the storytelling itself, therefore, is just a bit broader than a regular story, maybe like a bedtime story or something. Um, and as more suggestive of performance, narration 
more fully does justice to the many ways that myths are related again according to Thompson and Shrimp and I think that that's a useful way for thinking about the opening of the Odyssey that first of all there is an invocation of a muse there's a bringing in of a divine presence that says that as we listen to or read this story that we're participating in a kind of special time right the collapse of the time that might be set apart or sacred that's what the word sacred means and it might be told over and over again in some sort of ritualized fashion and the ritual itself and in, by invoking the thing that's separate makes it more present and that's what narrative is doing as um, the storytelling of this particular epic we enter the narrative in the second stanza in the middle of things as i've said let me just read it out here. I can't read the whole book to you, but um, we'll just read, get some of the early language out here. By now, all of the survivors, all who avoided headlong death, were safe at home, escaped in the wars and waves. But one man alone, his heart set on his wife and his return. Calypso, the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess, held him back, deep in her arcing caverns craving him for a husband but then when the wheeling seasons brought the year around that year spun out by the gods when he should re reach his home ithaca though not even there would he be free of his own trials or even among his own his loved ones then every god took pity all except poseidon he raged on, seething against the great Odysseus till he reached his native land. So what do we know from this stanza? We know, again, that Odysseus makes it home. We learn that in the first 25 page, or lines of the poem. Um, so all of the survivors of the Trojan War were home now, except one man alone. So there's, there's that condensation of the story onto the singular hero. Uh, notice how the language itself keeps interrupting what happens. So um, one man alone, and if you're look, following the translation here, we get an ellipsis. His heart set on his wife and his return. We get a dash. Calypso, the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess, held him back, deep in her arcing caverns, craving him for a husband. But then, when the wheeling seasons brought the year around, that year spun out by the gods when he should reach his home. So he's been here for some amount of time, at least one year, but it seems like multiple seasons have been spun out. But there, we've arrived at the year when the gods have decided that Odysseus is going to reach home. So the language interrupts the telling of what actually happens. The language interrupts the plot. There's always a delay in finding out what actually happens. That's how narrative works in storytelling. It works through a structure of delayed gratification. Now we already know that Homer is going, there, sorry, that Odysseus is going to get home, right? So the story isn't just about what happens, it's about what happens through the delayed gratification of the plot itself. That's where we get what Roland Barthes will call the so-called pleasure of the text. The pleasure comes from the delayed gratification. Um, notice the language itself keeps interrupting what happens. Calypso, the word Calypso, who's a, um, a kind of demigod or deity here, um, means hidden, right? So the word apocalypse, for example, which is revelation and uh, translated as revelation in uh, the Old Testament for the Christians and the, the Jews and the Muslims, right? Uh, uh, um, or, or sorry, in, in the New Testament for the Christians and the Muslims, not so much the Jews, but uh, the Greek uh, word apocalypse means to reveal what is hidden. And Calypso is that kind of earlier root. Um, uh, so Calypso means hidden yet even when uh, he, 
when Odysseus gets home, he'll still face trials. And all of the gods we know from this stanza, except Poseidon, take pity on Odysseus. Um, so we know that he makes it home. We know that Poseidon is pissed off at him. Why is Poseidon mad at Odysseus? Um, we don't know why yet, but Poseidon's gone away to Ethiopia at this point, um, and uh, which in the Greek mind was the far edges of the earth known. Um, uh, and so Poseidon has gone there for a ceremony. So we want to note from the beginning here that in this culture, there are limitations on what the gods can know. So Greek, Greek gods can be deceived. Um, by humans. And we might think of the story of Prometheus stealing fire from Zeus, for example, and giving fire to humans. Um, <clears throat> uh, as we go on with the next stanza here, I'll read it out uh, just to, to keep things going, but I, I'm going to have to stop reading out things or else it will take me ever, for um, too long to get through these lectures. Um, uh, uh, Poseidon, of course, is the god of the sea right um who's angry at odysseus so poseidon is go his his anger at odysseus is going to have something to, especially to do with preventing odysseus from reaching home um uh, back to ithaca um unlike all of the other greeks who've made their way home from the trojan war at this point um third uh sort of uh stanza or section break here according to the fagel's translation right um but now Poseidon had gone to visit the Ethiopians worlds away, Ethiopians off at the farthest limits of mankind, a people split in two, one part where the sun god sets and part where the sun god rises. There Poseidon went to receive an offering, bulls and rams by the hundred, by uh, far away off at the feast of the sea lords sat uh, the sea, the feast of the sea lord sat and took his pleasure <clears throat> but the other gods at home in the olympian halls of zeus met for full, for a full assembly there and among them now the father of the men uh, of men and gods would was first to speak and this is zeus right so uh um sorely troubled remembering the handsome aegisthus the man Agamemnon's son, renowned Orestes, killed. So here we're getting tons and tons of intertextuality, which makes this book confusing for newcomers to literature, um, or especially if you, you know, were raised something, quote, outside of, of this thing that we call Western culture or Western civilization. And so it begs the question, like, to what extent do we want to spend the time and energy that it takes to understand the intertextuality that's at work here? Who is Aegisthus? Who is Orestes? And why did he kill um, uh, Aegisthus? Um, so Zeus, who's the father of God, says, Ah, now, ah, how shameless, the way these mortals blame the gods. For us alone, they say, come all of their miseries. Yes, but they themselves, with their own reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. Look at Aegisthus now. Above and beyond his share, he stole Atrides' wife. He murdered the warlord coming home from Troy, though he knew it meant his own total ruin. Far in advance, we told him so ourselves. Dispatching the guide, the giant killer Hermes, don't murder the man, he said, don't court his wife. Beware, revenge will come from Orestes, Agamemnon's son. Orestes, um, that day he comes of age and, so, and longs for native, uh, his native land. So Hermes warned with all the good will in the world, but would Aegisthus hardened by heart give way? Now he pray, pays the price all at a single stroke. Okay, so what's happening here? Um, we're starting with a, in the middle of things. We know that Odysseus hasn't made his way home. We know that Poseidon is off. 
uh, uh, being worshipped uh, in Ethiopia. And there's this other gathering of gods. So this is another thing that's very interesting about the Greek culture is that the gods gather. The gods are in assembly. There's a leader of the gods who speaks first, Zeus. And he, the first thing that we get in the text is a reference not at all to Odysseus and his situation, but to a different context, right? And so uh, this is part of intertextuality. We get the mention of Aegisthus, who was killed by Orestes, Agamemnon's son. So here's this great example of intertextuality at work. The story of Orestes is famously captured, if you've read or if you want to look into it, um, by the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus, um, from who is, writes this down, you know, 525 or circa 525 or 24 BCE um, or before current era. Um, uh, and he lives till about 456. So this is, you know, a couple of hundred years being written down after Homer's text is written down. So we're looking at Homer's text, we're thinking about seventh century-ish before current era or before Christ, if you wanna really go for the Western civilization's conception of temporality. Uh, and so we already know that the stories are at work in oral culture by the time that Homer's text is being written down and copied into 24 books over and over again. So the Greek culture already knows the stories of these figures like Orestes. And so here's a little bit of background context here. Um, Aeschylus writes it down in a series of plays called the Oresteia. Um, but the story, of course, goes back even further. And Greek culture puts on tragedies or plays of tragedies and, and, and uh, puts them on in competitions for playwrights uh, for retelling the same stories that most of the people in the culture would know. It would be like something like, you know, the way that in my current culture that there's like a Boba Fett show um, uh, called the Mandalorian that's like a spin-off of the Star Wars characters and the Star Wars shows which are ubiquitous almost in entertainment media they, media they've been broadcast over and over again so we get spin-offs of different characters from different shows um, uh, and but the, the the general story of Luke Skywalker is kind of already known to us and Luke Skywalker who is having his own conflicts with fathers and we know of course if you've read or watched Joseph Campbell and people um, uh, 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 his lectures or read read books like the hero with a thousand faces um, that of course he was basing a lot of his mythological work on Greek mythology and that George Lucas the director of uh, the Star Wars, the original Star Wars um, trilogy uh, was um, highly influenced in interacting with Joseph Campbell. So there's a lot of that kind of mythological, st um, uh, uh, in intentional interaction with mythology going on in Star Wars to begin with. Um, but if I go back to the Greek culture here, um, the, what you need to sort of understand uh, is that there was this war with Troy um, and it was a war between the Greeks and the Trojans. And uh, it begins um, with uh, one of the princesses or queens, I suppose, of the Greeks being, quote, stolen um, by a Trojan named Paris. And uh, so then uh, the Greeks go all set, get gather together and go to set sail to to uh, destroy Troy um, over this um, uh, this this inconceivable sort of uh, offense that uh, someone would, would steal a queen. Uh, the Greeks are before they go to set off sail for Troy, um, they sacrifice a woman, uh, a young daughter, Iphigenia who's the daughter of King Agamemnon. She's sacrificed in order to give favorable winds for the Greek boats to get to Troy. So the Trojan War, as I just said, began with the Trojan Prince Paris 
and I put this in quotes, stealing Helen, the wife of Agamemnon's brother, Menelaus. Helen, however, was Paris's reward for choosing the goddess Aphrodite as the most beautiful goddess between Athena, who's also associated with wisdom, Hera, um, Zeus's wife, who's associated with marriage, and Aphrodite, who is associated with love. So Athena, Athena was obviously localized as the deity um, worshipped in Athens, which is in Greece, right? Um, and so associated with the Greeks. Back in Greece, Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, was obviously unhappy to see um, uh, to lose one of her daughters as a war sacrifice. And so kind of as <laughs> revenge or because um, she's angry at her husband, Ag Agamemnon, she begins a love affair with this guy named Aegisthus. Together, they plotted and killed Agamemnon on his successful return um, uh, from Troy. So uh, you get this family feud that's going on within Agamemnon's family. Um, uh, and Orestes then uh, who Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's son kills his mother out of revenge for her killing his father. Um, and then, and this is all in the Aeschylus trilogy, right, the, the Oresteia, then his sister, who even though she approved of uh, uh, Orestes killing Clytemnestra out of revenge for Clytemnestra killing Agamemnon, um, then feels compelled and duty bound to then um, kill um, Orestes himself, um, who has gone crazy, by the way. Um, the Furies have been set upon him for killing his own parents. So uh, um, uh, he couldn't help himself, but then, uh, so, so, so this, the, the sense of duty, what, what, you know, am I duty bound to kill one of my parents because they killed the other parent, right? But then I'm set upon by the Furies. And if we go all the way back to the start beginning of the Trojan War, it's like, yes, well, we have human folly, right? We have human humans who have stepped beyond their own realm, and Zeus is brought, bringing attention to this in the third stanza here in the Phaedrus translation. Um, Aegisthus was warned not to do this, not to seduce Clytemnestra. Um, uh, and he will pay the price for it. At the same time, if we know the story of the beginning of the Trojan War, we know that Paris didn't just, quote, steal Helen. We know that he was kind of set up by the gods um, uh, who did not want to choose. They knew well enough not to choose between um, uh, who is the fairest between Aphrodite and Hera uh, and Athena um, because uh, uh, it was going to set off a kind of jealous feuding between the goddesses, right? So this mortal guy, um, uh, Paris, gets thrown into this kind of impossible situation. He ends up choosing love, and so he has the goddess Aphrodite's help in order to, quote, seduce Helen, who is considered the most beautiful of mortal women at the time. Um, uh, then it's only a familiar relationship between Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon, um, who get together um, and sacrifice at one of Agamemnon's daughters, Iphigenia, in order to get favorable winds to go to Troy. On themselves. So there's a whole lot of layers of um, uh, accountability going on, of the notion of sacrifice going on, and what we do as humans to win the favor of gods, but also when we as humans transcend the limitations that we might have. And so again, that theme of human limitation is going to be with us throughout. And I think that we get this commentary from Zeus, the head of gods on human limitation uh, with the context of Aegisthus and Clytemnestra here. Um, 
invoked. Um, and so I say in my notes here twice in the first 50 lines of the book, we see the warning against overstepping one's limits. Zeus, the father of men and gods, says, ah, how shameless the way these mortals blame the gods. From us alone, they say, come all their miseries. Yes, but they themselves, with their reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. Just like the reckless ways of Odysseus's men in the opening stanza they've eaten the cattle of the sun and therefore they pay the price of not being able to make it their way back home hermes who's the messenger god um has warned um uh, the the people has warned especially aegisthus in this case then we get athena breaking in and to this conversation and she speaks on behalf of odysseus uh so i'm not going to keep reading out the um uh the the poem too um too much so please read on your own um but athena um who's often defined um by the text as having sparkling eyes glinting eyes that show up the, um, so the epithet um, that is, that uh, accompanies a person's name, um, or in the previous stanza we get Atrides shows up, and we know that Agamemnon and Menelaus are defined um, as being in the house of Atrides, who is their father, right? So uh, it's a patriarchal culture, and so we get all, almost every time that someone's name is invoked, there's something else that defines them. It could be something in relation to lineage. It could be something in relation to a characteristic that uh, uh, that uh, is some, somehow um, defines um, uh, or helps us remember them as a character. So on page 79 here, if you're following along in the text, um, and sparkling-eyed Athena drove them at her home. Father, son of Kronos, right? Of course she would know who her father is and who her grandfather is, right? But that's, we get the, narr the narrator telling us and reminding us who is who in this intertextual web of Greek mythology. Father, son of Kronos, our high and mighty king, surely he goes down to, to death a death he earned in full. And she's talking about Aegisthus, right? Surely Aegisthus does. But my heart breaks for Odysseus, that seasoned veteran cursed by fate for so long. Far from his loved ones still, he suffers torments off on a wave-washed island rising at the center of the seas. Um, and so uh, then we get a, a dark wooded island and there a goddess makes her home daughter of Atlas. So the daughter is Calypso, right? Who's the daughter of Atlas, wicked titan who, surround, who sounds the deep um, in all its depths, whose shoulders lift on high the colossal pillars thrusting earth and sky apart. So remember we have that Greek conception from the beginning of Gaia and Uranus um, and that pushing away from those two and we can see definitely it's not the time right now to jump into egyptian mythology with um isis and osiris where we get a similar types of imagery working um but there's definitely a lot of influence cross influence from different cultures in the mediterranean world um ancient world as well that we won't have time to explore here today but i just make mention of that uh um, and so uh, we're getting all sorts of references to titans, to different types of gods, to different types of, of stories. Um, and um, along with this is this, this tendency for the poet Homer to say someone's name and then say something about that person as a kind of reminder, right? Um, and so Calypso has kept Odysseus captive and um, Athena thinks that this is unjust. Um, uh, she says, Olymp Odysseus longs to die. He's so lonely, he wants to go home. Uh, and so she says, Olympia and Zeus, have you no care for him in your lofty heart? Did he never win favor with sacrifices? Um, 
burned beside the ships on the broad plain of Troy. Why, Zeus, why so dead set against Odysseus? So one another thing to notice about Greek gods in this culture is that Greek gods not only find favor with some humans, but they care. They have a sense of care, for some of them anyway. And, you know, later philosophers, I think Martin Heidegger in the 20th century says something about this, that when we think about this, is there's a kind of absurdity here, because when we care for somebody else or something else, care structures us in time. And this is why existentialist philosophers like Martin Heidegger are concerned with this, that human mortality is in a way structured temporally speaking so in heidegger's thought uh we are being toward death it's something that characterizes what human existence is for us or what martin heidegger called dasein or being there um and what that does what we are is we're structured toward towards a sense that we know that at some point in time we're going to die as humans maybe tomorrow maybe 80 years from now but I'm going to meet my death and it's my death is unknown to me but it's also the most personal thing that I will ever endure is my own death as a person my own demise and so we're structured um, by in a sort of being toward time a being towards an unknown end of our own mortal life and by that structure towards that unknown it puts us into a kind of linear temporal existence now why is that important for thinking about the greeks well um uh, you know if you think about a god being all-knowing and all omniscient a kind of more christian-centered god um why would a god or anyone who is an immortal care about something as fleeting as mortality and human life but in the greek context there is an attention that the greeks have to at least some of us mortals um, that structures a relationship of care between the two and also obviously zeus cares for athena as well um, and a lot of times she is characterized as actually being zeus's favorite child um, so zeus says um, uh, my child um, what nonsense you let slip through your teeth. Now, how on earth could I forget Odysseus, great Odysseus, who excels all men in wisdom, excels in offerings too. He gives the immortal gods who, uh, uh, he gives the immortal gods who rule the vaulting skies. Uh, no, it's the earth shaker. It's Poseidon who is unappeased, forever fuming against him for the Cyclops, whose giant eye he blinded, godlike Polyphemus, towering over all the Cyclopses, clans, and power. And so now we figure out um, why Poseidon is pissed off at Odysseus, right? He's angry at Odysseus because Odysseus has killed a Cyclops, a one-eyed being named Polyphemus. Um, who seem to be the head of the Cyclops clans. And then as usual, once you mention somebody's name, we get a little bit of background history or we get a little bit of context. The nymph Thusa bore the Cyclops, um, but the nymph uh, Thusa is the daughter of um, Phorcus, uh, um, who is um, a merman, uh, uh, a primordial sea god so we get the thusa and we get thusa's father right so every time a new main name is mentioned that we get the mention of a father or familial type of lineage relationship so again when we're talking about patriarchal western culture that's at least like the evidence that that, that we, what we mean um by that um so uh um, forcus was the lord of the barren salt sea and she met Poseidon. So there's a sea relationship between Poseidon and Phorcus. Um, uh, uh, they produce this offspring and Odysseus has killed the Cyclops of the offspring. Um, and so um, that is what, that's what got, has got him into trouble. Um, 
uh, Lord Poseidon, I trust, will not let his anger go, says Zeus. Um, how can he stand his ground against the will of all the gods at once, though, one god alone? And so then we're starting to get the sense that Athena has brought this to the attention of Zeus, and now we're going to see some movement on the fate of Odysseus. Um, Athena and her eyes flash, right? Her eyes are always flashing bright. It says, Father, son of Cronus, our most high high and mighty king, um, if now it really pleases the blissful gods that wise Odysseus shall return home at last, let us dispatch the guide giant Hermes, giant killer Hermes, down to um, um, Ojigia Island, down to announce at once to the nymph with lovely braids our fixed decree. Odysseus is going to get to go home. Calypso, you have to let him go. Um, uh, and then um, she, while I, myself, Athena, and go down to Ithaca and rouse his son braver to a braver pitch, inspire his heart with courage to summon the flowing-haired Achaeans to full assembly. So she's going to go down to Ithaca, to Greece, and she's going to start rousing up um, Odysseus's son and uh, um, uh, uh, um, prepare the way for Odysseus's return. Then she says, I'm going to send him to Sparta and to Pylos. And so he's going, this son of Odysseus is going to go around and start reuniting, in a sense, the, the Greeks. Um, and so Athena vowed, and under her feet she fastened. Um, the supple sandals, ever glowing gold, that wing her toward the waves and boundless earth, the rushing, gusting, with the rushing of gusting winds. Um, she sees her rugged spear tipped with a bronze point, heavy weighted, massive shaft she wields to break the lines of heroes, the father, the mighty father's daughter storms against. And down she swept from Olympus, craggy pit craggy peaks and lit on Ithaca standing tall at Odysseus's gates and so we get this is that kind of cinematography cinematography right that I mentioned um, in my first lecture look at the way she maneuvers and transfers from the Olymp uh, uh, Mount Olymp Olympia to um, or Olympus to um, uh, down into Greek actual life. And whenever she does this, she's going to take possession of a body. Um, so this is another thing that recurs that Athena um, is the goddess, but she will take um, the form of this particular um, character, Mentes, at least to begin here. So over on page 81, um, we get uh, um, a site, the site of Odysseus's son Telemachus, right? First, by far to see her was Telemachus sitting among the suitors, heart obsessed with grief. He could almost see his magnificent father here in the mind's eye. So we get internality, right? We get a lot of like these things that are happening almost like a frozen freeze frame in the way that you might see it in Japanese animation sometimes. There's a freeze frame and there's something going on in the, the, the minds of the characters. If only he might drop from the clouds, if only Odysseus, his father, might drop from the clouds and drive these suitors in a route through the halls. There's almost an internal desire that we're seeing. We're inside of Telemachus's head here. Um, daydreaming so as he sat among the suitors, he glimpsed Athena now and straight through the porch he went, mortified that a guest might still be standing at the doors. Um, and so there's some Greek terminology here, um, theox theoxony or the law of the gods or xenia, um, X-E-N-I-A. Um, and this refers to the laws of hospitality that are ancient in this culture, but they're also in relationship to the gods so that you cannot, if a guest shows up at your house, um, you can't leave them unattended. Um, you also don't 
uh, begin your relationship with them in a standoff way. You welcome them in with some kind of hospitality. Um, and so Telemachus sees this figure He's kind of like in an in-between type of space. There's a lot of recognition. It's profound. Um, but Athena isn't showing up as her goddess self. She's showing up inside this other figure. Um, and Telemachus notices and says, oh my gosh, that somebody's come to my um, gates and, and hasn't been welcomed in yet. So I need to go and do this. And it's that he's... Um, compelled by the law of the gods that he must do this, right? Theosny. Um, uh, he led the way and Pallas Athena followed. Once in the high roofed hall, he took her lance and fixed it firm in a burnished rack against the sturdy pillar. There were a row of other spears and battled Odysseus's spears stood stacked and waiting. Then he escorted her to high elaborate chair of honor over it draped a cloth and here he placed his guest with a stool to rest her feet. But for himself, he drew up a low reclining chair before. So part of the law of hospitality is you let the stranger in, you give them the seat on high and you sit below them. Uh, and then, um, uh, uh, he's kind of offended by the uproar of the suitors um, who are there and we know that the suitors are there uh, with their sights on marrying his mother Odysseus's wife because Odysseus has been gone so long and Telemachus is, as the son is in this um, uh, terrible situation where he wants his father to return he's come of age um, the suitors want to um, usurp his father's place and then basically get rid of him, right? And so we'll see this throughout many um, plays and stories in Western culture, the idea of inheritance, right? The idea of an interrupted inheritance, particularly from a king to a prince, from a father to a son. And we're getting all sorts of life and imagery of what's happening inside the halls of Odysseus. The spears are against the wall. The suitors are carousing. They're um, partying. Um, they're loud. The loudness offends um, Telemachus, who has taken in this stranger um, and is embarrassed by the ways that they're carrying on in this home that is almost his, but yet he doesn't quite have control over it. Uh, we get a picture of the bard showing up here on page 82 in the middle around lines 177 or so. Um, uh, a herald placed an ornate lyre in Phemius's hands, the bard who always performed among them there. They forced the man to sing. A rippling prelude, and no sooner had he struck up his rousing song than Telemachus, head close to Athena's sparkling eyes, spoke low to his guest so that no one else could hear. So we get the broader scene, we get the music starting to happen, and then we get a zeroing in so that there can be a more private conversation between Telemachus and Athena. And he says, Dear stranger, would you be shocked by what I say? Look at them over there. Not a care in the world, just liars and tunes. It's easy for them, all right. They feed on another's goods and go scot-free. A man whose white bones lie strewn in uh, the rain somewhere, rotting on the land or rolling down the ocean's salty swells. But that man, if they caught sight of him at home in Ithaca, by God, they'd all pray to be faster on their feet than richer in bars of gold and heavy robes. But now it's no use. He's died a wretched death. No comforts left for us, not even if someone somewhere says he's coming home. The day of his return will never dawn. And so there's this kind of giving up of hope, right? And we know, as readers, we know that actually, no, Athena is coming here to tell him that Odysseus will eventually make it home. We know it's going to happen. And so we get a little bit of Telemachus's um, uh, exaggeration, right? Um, hyperbole is the term um, in uh, rhetoric here. 
Um, he's never going to make it home. Even if somebody came to tell me that he's going to make it home, I don't think that I could even believe him. Uh, um, and that sets up a different set of knowing, right? A, a relationship between the audience or the hearer, or the listener, and what is on the page or what's being told in the story. So that distinction, that difference, is going to be um, what we call irony. Right, um, uh, the uh, on stage, like the dramatic, um, the definition from play acting, for example, is when the audience knows more than the characters themselves on stage, and that will be a device that literature uses, um, um, that literary writers use to create a separation or a distinction between what we're listening to and hearing, um, and then the what the a distance between that and what the characters know on stage right and so we get two opposing sets of desire right telemachus has the desire to see his father but he is totally distraught has no hope the audience knows that odysseus is coming back so the gaze of the audience starts being able to sustain the broader picture of the story itself as the epic unfolds. But it also draws the audience's attention in to be invested in the story of Odysseus coming home so that this, the audience can do justice by their gaze to um, uh, um, fulfilling uh, what Telemachus needs as a son. Uh, and then um, we get this back and forth exchange. I won't go into detail completely here between what happens between Odysseus and, or sorry, Telemachus and Athena. Um, uh, we get along uh, the lines of uh, um Mm, around 205 or so we get her eyes glinting goddess athena answered my whole story of course i'll tell you it's it point by point because uh telemachus has said you know forgive me for like troubling you with my woes i want to know who you are let's find like don't don't be a stranger to me anymore um and she says my whole story i'll tell point by point wise old um, Ancaeus was my father. My own name is Mentes, right? So we know that Athena has possessed the embodied, and, the, and then we can think about gender bending, right? And like binary transgender types of, of, of things that are going on definitely in Greek culture by this goddess possessing. Um, uh, uh, but it's only after um, Mentes slash Athena has been able to sit and drink and eat and has been welcomed in by Telemachus, um, that then uh, Telemachus is able to ask Mentes to speak. So she says, he slash he says, um, my own name is Mentes, um, a lord of the Taphian men who love their oars, and here I've come just now with ship and crew sailing the wine dark sea, it's always the wine dark sea and Homer, um, to foreign ports of call, to um, Temis uh, out, of, out for bronze, our cargo gleaming iron, our ship lies moored off farmlands far from town, riding the Rithrung Cove beneath the Mount Nyan's woods. And for the ties between your father and myself, we've been friends forever, I'm proud to say. And he would bear me out if you went and questioned the old Laertes. And so we get Laertes, of course, who's Odysseus's father, Telemachus's grandfather. Um, and uh, uh, Mentes says, I heard that your father was back, right? It doesn't full on say that uh, that he's alive um, uh, quite yet, but he says your father that is, but no, the gods thwart his passage, yet I tell you great Odysseus is not dead. He's still alive. So there's a, at first I heard he was back, but then he says I tell you he's, he's alive. Um, so that little bit of delay, like I'm not like the, the storyteller's not going to give you everything right away, um, but set some sort of obstacle up. And so in this way, the form of the language also participates in Odysseus's 
struggle to get back home. The form mimics the content of the story itself. Uh, um, and through this back and forth, um, Telemachus um, starts getting some hope from uh, Athena, um, who encourages him to go on a journey and to find out from other people what has happened to uh, his father. Um, and in this way, Telemachus is going to sort of come into his own as um, a young man. Over on page 85, um, uh, ready Telemachus took up took her up at once. Well, my friend, seeing you want to probe and press the question, once this this is this explains the situation of the suitors. One once this house was rich, no doubt, beyond reproach when the man you mentioned still lived here at home. Uh, now the gods reversed our fortune with a vengeance, wiped that man off the earth like no one else before. So he still doesn't quite want to believe that Odysseus is alive. I would never have grieved so much about his death if he'd gone down with the comrades off in Troy or died in the armed of, arms of loved ones once he had wound down that long coil of war. Then all united Achaea, all of the Greeks really, um, would have raised his tomb and he'd have won his son great fame for years to come. But now the whirlwinds have ripped him away no fame for him he's lost and gone now out of sight out of mind and i he's left me tears and grief nor do i rack my heart and grieve for him alone no longer now the gods have invented their own miseries to plague me um and he talks about the other suitors who've come to take his land and so part of what is making Telemachus suffer is not that just that he loves his father, he can barely remember his father, but that his father's fame has not been solidified in order to establish his own name, Telemachus. And so he's in this state of arrested development because of the lack of closure around his father's death or um, life. Um, and then in the meantime, these suitors have, have been here um, and uh, um, the goddess says, shameful, oh, how much you need Odysseus, gone so long. Now he'd lay hands on these brazen suitors, if only he would appear now. Um, and so then again, she urges him uh, uh, to go on a journey and find out what has happened to uh, his father, find out for himself whether or not Odysseus is alive. And this is tied to his manhood over on page 87 here. Um, then once you've sealed those matters, seen them through, think hard, reach down deep in your heart and soul for a way to kill these suitors in your house by stealth or open combat. You must not cling to your boyhood any longer. It's time you were a man. Haven't you heard what glory per Prince Orestes has won throughout the world when he killed that cunning murderous Aegisthus who'd killed his famous father. And so now we get the composure, the composing of the poem sort of showing up, right? We've seen the theme of, of Aegisthus and um, Orestes revenging his father showing up earlier on. Now Athena is invoking this by way of Zeus telling it earlier by telling it to Telemachus, right? And so that is the, it's not just the intertextuality, but it's something about the way that the poem has been orchestrated as a composition itself. Um, uh, later on down the same page, we get the invocation of the gift that there should be a gift that is given to the stranger. So again, that law of Xenia, um, the law of hospitality is showing up. Um, but uh, Athena slash Mentis says, don't give me the gift right now. Um, let's put that off. Um, uh, um, and then later on, she says, choose something fair and fine and a good reward that gift is going to bring you. Um, and so promises are made. 
Um, and she said, uh, the, the narrator says, with that promise off and away, uh, Athena, the bright-eyed goddess, flew like a bird in soaring flight, but left his spirit filled with a nerve and courage, charged with his father's memory more than ever now. His, he felt his senses quicken, overwhelmed with wonder. This was a god. He knew it well and made at once for the suitors a man like, like a god himself. And so there's, again, there's play back and forth between internality. We know that there's some, on some sort of deeper level, that Telemachus has uh, um, recognized some sort of divine spark that's inhabited the character of Mentes, the man, um, that, that, that he is both Mentes and something more than Mentes. Uh, and then we get the shift to um, Penelope, right? The bar back to the bard um, who's been singing. And I think of this in some ways. I mean, like think of like famous films like Casablanca, for example, when um, Sam, the piano player, um, plays as time goes by, right? And Rick bursts into uh, the club Casablanca and says I never I thought, thought I told you never to play that song right and then of course he's been convinced um, to play the song um, by his former lover right um, uh, and so you know I do think it's really useful to think about cinematography and to think about the the gestures that show up in storytelling especially the old classic films like Casablanca that are kind of um, uh, maybe not an epic Casablanca, but that 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 draws on these kind of like immortal types of gestures that show up. Um, so the bard has shown up and is singing, and it's saying this song about Odysseus that 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 you know brings Penelope, Odysseus's wife, out, and she's upset that he's singing. Um, and we get, of course, that she's not just Penelope, but she's the daughter of Icarius. Um, she says to the bard Phemius, so many other songs you know to hold us spellbound, works of the gods and the men that singers celebrate. Sing one of those as you sit beside them there and drink, and they drink their wine in silence. And Telemachus breaks in and he says, why, mother, right? Why deny our devoted bard the chance to entertain us? Anyway, the spirit stirs him on bards are not to blame so this is where i was saying earlier that the narrator we get a little bit of the narrator's um uh own desires showing up here right don't blame the poets don't blame the bards zeus is to blame he deals to each and every laborer on this earth whatever doom he pleases why fault the bard if he sings the argives harsh fate it's always the latest song the one that echoes last in the listener's ears that people praise the most. Courage, mother, harden your heart and listen. Odysseus was scarcely the only one, you know, whose journey home was so blotted out at Troy. Others, so many others died there too. So, mother, go back to your quarters, tend to your own tasks and distaff the loom and keep the women working that hard as well. As for getting orders, uh, uh, men will see to that, but I, most of all, I hold the reins of power in this house. And it's like, uh oh, woo, Telemachus is stepping up as a young man. And so Penelope is astonished, right? Um, and she draws back. Um, and so the young man is asserting his claims to power, um, and he admonishes his mom. Um, <clears throat> And she listens to him though, and she steps back. Um, uh, and then we get this, the, the exchange um, between Telemachus and the suitors where he starts yelling at the suitors. If you decide the fare is better, richer here, destroying one man's goods and going scot-free, all right then, carve away with this kind of, um, uh, um, gesture that says go ahead do this like um, the, um, uh, this kind of cynicism that sh that shows up uh, as well uh, but it's also showing up as a kind of challenge um, that the emboldened Telemachus has um, here 
and then we get ex the the suitors who um, are uh, go go back and forth. Um, uh, uh, Eupithes son, an Antinous breaks the silence. Right, well, Telemachus, only the gods could teach you to sound so high and mighty. And there's again this kind of moment, this this element of mockery, right? Um, uh, perhaps another version of irony, since irony is always dealing with a kind of distance, right? Um, uh, the language of mo mockery and mimicry, cynicism, um, uh, uh, parody, these are all going to deal with different ways that language distances itself from what's actually being said. Well, Telemachus, only the gods could teach you to sound so high and mighty, such brave talk. I pray that Zeus will never make you king of Ithaca, though your father's crown is no doubt yours by birth. So he recognizes that uh, um, something is going on here, that, 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 that Telemachus is being treated unjustly, but at the same time he's mocking him. So this is very much where I think that we see the overstepping of limits that humans do. Um, uh, and there's already this that's being set up from book one here um, that the suitors have been egregious. They've been um, taking advantage of their hosts, which crosses the lines and limitations of that notion of Xenia and that they are setting themselves up for some mega payback. Um, uh, um, Telemachus cool-headedly responds and counters firmly, right? So we get, we're getting all sorts of language about what it is to be a man and how to stand up. Um, uh, Antinous, even though my words may offend you, I'd be happy to take the crown if Zeus presents it. Um, so he takes, he accepts this kind of challenge that he says, you know, if they, if they say that Odysseus is dead and the crown is mine, I will step into that, right? Um, you think that nothing else could befall a man? It's really not so bad to be a king. All at once your place, palace grows in wealth, your honors grow as well. But there are hosts of other Achaean princes. Look, young and old, crowds of them in our island here. And they, and anyone of the lot might hold the throne. Now great Odysseus is dead, but I'll be lord of my own house and servants, all that King Odysseus won for me by force. And then another um, uh, suitor says, but we should leave this in the gods' lap right telemachus um which a Achaean lord will which will oversee it um oversee ithaca and so this sort of back and forth um uh telemachus is starting to play them he says clearly my father's journey is home is lost forever i no longer trust in rumors but let me go i'm going to make this deal with you that mentis is set up let me go and make sure and solidify things. Give me a year. I'm going to go and do this and I'll come back. And if I haven't found out his fate in a year, then I'll come back and use, I'll choose the suitor for my mom. Uh, um, uh, but until then, leave my, leave my mom alone. Uh, they don't exactly do that. They keep on feasting and taking advantage of the wealth of the house. Um, but then Telemachus turns to go. Um, he has this exchange with the servant Eurycleia around lines 490 to 491. Um, uh, uh, he traded 20 oxen, honored her on a par with his own loyal wife at home, but fearing the queen's anger, never shared her bed. Um, she was his grandson's escort now, and now bore a torch, for she was the one of all the maids who loved the prince most. She'd nursed him as a baby. And so we get a lot of characters. So um, it's just interesting. I want to notice that, that the, the attention that the narrator gives to the servant here, 
um, the servant who's been steadfast throughout different generations. And so we see that kind of servant character showing up throughout literature. Um, you can see it in Alfred in the Batman stories, for example, right? The one who's raised the family, um, the, the, the leader of the family. Um, uh, and, and he asks her not to, um, eventually asks her not to tell, um, his mother until later on, until after he's left. And so that's going to take us to the end of book one here, um, which I delve into some detail here, um, for sure. But some the quick things to recap, um, the entrance of the, in the middle of things is going to lead us into a highly intertextual story. But within that intertextuality, if you know some of the intertext, if you know some of the literary allusions, you will see that that is also setting up the kind of symphony that the epic is going to tell, that the themes of human limitation, of um, overstepping one's bounds are going to show up, that there's going to be comparing of Orestes who took up the task, the duty to take revenge for his father. The Telemachus is going to be um, comparing himself to that in his own journey of becoming a man. And that the book itself, I think cont contrary to the ways that many people think about the Odyssey. The Odyssey is not necessarily being framed as the story of Odysseus making his way home. Now we will get a lot of that, but from the very beginning, what's being tied to that story is Telemachus becoming a man. And we don't even see Odysseus other than he's mentioned, it's mentioned that he's on the island of Calypso and that he got lost in the sea. We don't really get to see him at all in book one of the Odyssey. Um, and so thinking about the desire and that delayed gratification that shows up in the narration and the storytelling of the text. But we don't, in broader culture, think of Telemachus right away, even though the framing of the text itself um, centers on his desire and on his coming of age. And we as the audience, we as the listeners, are holding the fact that we know that Odysseus is coming home, even if Telemachus doesn't quite know it yet. We are being asked to hold that space. And in holding that space, it sets up the environment, the space of the story by which Telemachus will go about finding his own way. So I'll leave us there for today. Um, thanks for listening or thanks for watching. If you like this, if this is you're getting something out of this, please support the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory on Patreon. It's for even if it's, you know, about the amount of a cup of coffee a month, you know, um, anything like a dollar or more a month, um, every little bit helps. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll pick up with you again in the contextualized reading for uh, book two. Have a great day or night wherever you are.